All right, we are back. It's no apologies on Beck. We've got special guest Jeffrey Tucker, the president and founder of Brownstone Institute and so much more. Um, Jeffrey, thank you again for returning for this segment. Uh, question for you. You had been a friend, a longtime friend of Murray Rothbard. Mm -hmm. And um, first off, let me know if I'm wrong. Would you say that, that Murray was an advocate for anarchy? I would, so long as we understand what that word means. I, I think he, he had a, a sort of a precise definition of it. Of course, it didn't mean chaos. It actually meant order. It's just that he thought that uh, the state, as we think of this institution, is a course of taxing institution that inflates the money supply and starts wars and locks you down during pandemics and so on, uh, generally is, is damaging to society and that we'd be far better off overall if we just used all the things that the state usually does, we'd turn over to the private enterprise, he thought we'd be better off as a society. So in that sense, he was an anarchist. He, he was also a provocateur, so he liked to go to extremes just to get people's attention. Right. So, so we're, uh, would you say that there's a little bit of interplay between anarchy and minarchy, and then also what the, the, the trendy term is volunteerism? Uh, are these pretty yeah. much all different flavors of the same thing? Uh, so he would disagree with that because okay. uh, the minarchists, uh, you know, believe in a minimal state, and Murray certainly didn't. Now the reason for that, uh, Murray would say, is that you know usually the minimal state says the market's not good at providing security, law, and and justice. But Murray would always point to counterexamples that private security seems to work pretty well. Private arbitration seems to have gone really well, much better than government courts. Government courts are not typically the best distributors of justice. Um, so he thought whatever the market would come up with as, a, as, a, as an alternative would generally be better, not perfect, but better than what the state is giving us. So he would sometimes say that actually the most dangerous power you can give the state is to turn over the monopoly of the police to them. And he's got a point there. I mean, who enforced all the lockdowns over the last year? It was ultimately uh, the police power. And if we had private police that were serving people, uh, then they'd be far less likely to undertake these sort of brutal tactics. So I think I think he has a, a lot of very good arguments on his side. Now, I must say, personally, uh, even though I, I'm very attracted to this kind of uh, Rothbardian uh, anarchistic ideals, you know, we're in a, an emergency situation right now in civilization, as far as I'm concerned. And if we could just get back to a basic liberalism of the old school, you know, where we live under the rule of law, where we presume that people have human rights and you're free to speak and free to associate, those kind of basic things that we used to always take for granted, if we can get those back, uh, we'd be making huge steps in the right direction. So if we, that's my goal personally for Brownstone, is to embrace this kind of big tent, old fashioned uh, enlightenment uh, style liberalism where people are, are free and, we're, and presumed to be free. That would be a nice, a nice beginning. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that leads me then to, to my next question. And this is really one that I think, um, I don't know, maybe it'll be challenging. Hopefully it'll be challenging for you. I, I would listen to some lectures that you've given in the past in which you tell generally younger people that the, the way to affect change, to make a difference, is to you go through commerce, right? To, to create, to produce, to develop, to be an entrepreneur, and to stay away from politics. Uh, but it seems to me that Brownstone is sort of mm -hmm. bridging that because mm -hmm. um, you're uh, obviously trying to sway public opinion and, yeah. um, and thereby change uh, the course of politics. So how do you, how do, do you still adhere to that idea of ignore, or stay away from, uh -huh. run away from politics or are you tempered somewhat? Uh, tempered somewhat, and I'll tell you why. Um, um, I think the neglect of politics has been actually not good for us in the sense that uh, it, if you neglect it entirely, all you do is turn over the entire field to bad guys. And basically that's what's happened. And unfortunately, if you're a small business, uh, while that might provide you, you know, a good escape hatch for a while, uh, if the politicians can just shut you down, you've got to do something about it. So getting involved in po politics, I mean, it's, politics has to be part of the solution we're looking at. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I don't think I knew that as well as I know that now. However, I don't think it's the whole solution. Uh, what we really need right now is a new social and cultural consensus that embraces freedom as the presumption of what is constitutes the, 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 the good life. 
And unless we get that in place, I don't care. All the politics of the world are not going to fix it. Politics responds to social cultural change. And, and it doesn't exist apart from it. So I think if you want to really make a, a big difference in the world, then you need to like educate yourself, um, uh, uh, f f you know, get curious about, about topics like economics and public health and these sorts of things, and then speak out and make your voice known. And we have so many opportunities to do that right now. So everybody can make a difference in our world right now. You don't have to run for public office. Um, as for voting, I'm not big into it myself, but clearly, uh, votes have made a difference. And we saw uh, this this week how uh, votes have uh, really, uh, I think, shocked a lot of uh, people in the Democratic Party who thought that they could just do whatever they wanted. Now they're finding that they're all being thrown out of office uh, for doing what they wanted instead of what we wanted. So I think this is it's an important element of change. I just don't think it, it constitutes the whole of it. Gotcha. I'm glad to hear that. I was a little bit disheartened when I heard the, the first lecture, uh, <laughs> and uh, it, which you may not know, but I am a, a state rep here, and so uh, and it's a it's a it's let me tell you it's a pain in the ass. Um, so thank your you for your sacrifice. Book, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, your previous book, Right Wing Collectivism. Yeah, that I, I I'm very intrigued. I'm gonna I'm gonna get that and read it um, mm -hmm. because it seems to me that this whole right wing left wing is. The, it's it's not an actual it's not the the it's not the uh, prism through which we would uh, should be looking at things it's it's uh, there's either big government on in a left way or a right way or there's limited government that's right and i'm wondering i think that's the problem in the republican party is that it is a blend of two very different things that somehow are trying to find common ground have you uh, evaluated that uh, perspective. Right. So I wrote that book uh, in 2000, uh, it was 2015, as a kind of a warning to, uh, uh, to people on the right uh, to let them know that they could be dabbling in things that are going to end up in results that they won't like. Uh, collectivist systems run by dictators and uh, your breakdown of world trade and division of people by race and this kind of thing. So what I did in that book actually was I, I wrote it because nobody else had written it, right? That's the only reason I write anything is that I feel like it's not been talked about enough. But um, I think people are fairly f uh, familiar with the left-wing socialist uh, tradition of thought and whether you like it or don't like it, but they don't know that there's another branch of what I call in here Hegelianism that tended in a right-wing direction, that supported, um, uh, that supported uh, pr property and, and, and religion and um, uh, people, insofar as you could change all those things into a sort of loyalty to the state. So there's this right-wing collectivist tradition out there, too. And unless we're aware of it, we might tend to be a little bit maybe uh, too sanguine towards it or tolerant of it and not aware of when we're being manipulated. So I think there's that tendency in the Republican Party. Like, they, too, have to rediscover uh, basic principles of, of, of freedom. So that was the, the theme of, of that book. And I think it's, a, it's easily my most controversial book and the one I, I still get in trouble for all the time. But I had some brand new research in there. And I think in the, in the end, it might be my most lasting intellectual contribution. Ah, interesting. Well, I, I, I'm expecting there's going to be several more that may be in competition in, in future years. Do you, I, I'm one that thinks that we are going to, this pendulum from central centralized federal power is going to swing back it and is. perhaps has been hastened by what's going on with COVID yep. back to the states. Uh, do you see, well, let me just hit right to the point. Do you think it is moderately likely that sometime over the next 30 years we could have a dissolution of the 50 states into some various compacts of other states? We don't have to. I mean, we can fix the problems, but on the current trajectory, uh, it does feel like civil war in this country. And, and, and places like North Dakota, South Dakota, Florida, Texas, Georgia, uh, Mississippi, uh, and Arizona, New Mexico, and, and so on, are, are just about fed up. And the Biden administration is using this pandemic to divide people in vicious ways. And if this keeps up, it's going to lead to, to, to disaster. And actually, we're facing this immediately with this vaccine mandate. And we've got state laws that are clashing directly with federal laws. And it's, it's like a war to the knife. Who's in charge? Well, we're going to find out pretty soon because it's all going to be in the courts. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely will. And I, I'm glad 
that our previous president uh, had the effect on the courts uh, that he did. Uh, hopefully, so hopefully uh, it will come to, to uh, being all about uh, states' rights, state sovereignty. Um, uh, Jeffrey, I have appreciated your time. Uh, I meant to ask you during break and not on air. You, you've given us more than the time that, that we were allowed. Are, do you have a few minutes for one more segment, or do you need to run? Sadly, I do have a 3.30 okay. I need to prepare for. I'm so sorry. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. I appreciate it very much. Folks, look him, look him up. Uh, look up Brownstone Institute and uh, check out his books. Wonderful, wonderful, intellectual, in a good way, guy. Jeffrey, thank you very much.